Hello and welcome to this week's episode of the WSBC podcast. This week's message was uh, from James 1, 22 through 27, and it was about how we are called to be doers of the word, not just hearers. So let's just start right there. Uh, we've asked in previous podcasts, I don't know which one, but uh, probably last week or the week before, how do we go from agreeing with the scripture to acting? And that lines up pretty good with uh, being doers and hearers, uh, similar ideas there. So I don't want to ask the same question this week, but it seems like this idea is something that we keep coming back to. It it, it keeps inserting itself into uh, what the scripture is about and just our conversations about it. So is it is it just a hard issue to gain control over in your life? Uh, well, I think um, I think we need to look at it from two different perspectives. First of all, let's don't take away from what the scripture's saying. So sometimes we can, in an attempt to to admit that we struggle with obedience, we can dilute or water down what the passage is actually saying and we can unintentionally interject something Hmm. that's not there. And so here in this passage, James is being brutally clear that we are to be doers of the word and not hearers only. And if we're hearers only, we're deceiving ourselves about the nature of our relationship with God later In the passage, he talks about religion, true religion. And again, he uses that phrase, you're you're deceiving yourself if you you don't bridle your tongue. Hmm. He's not going to be finished there. In chapter 2, he goes into really that classic discussion of faith and works and the relationship between faith and works. And, And the essence of that is faith without works is dead. It's not true saving faith if it doesn't result in works. You can jump out of the book of James and say, go to 1 John, and you have these these evidences of true salvation. What does true saving faith look like? What does it result in, in a person's life? And so the long and short of it for James is it results in people who walk in obedience to the Word of God. Hmm. Not people who just hear it, but people who actually live it. They put it into practice in their lives by the power of the Holy Spirit. So let's Let's not, um, let's not take anything away from that and, and try to make it um, say less than it does hmm. because uh, it's very clear and very blunt. Now, on, this, on the other side of that coin, we do know realistically that we struggle uh, with obedience, but we need to think that through as well. The Bible presents a picture that people who know Christ, they... They obey him. They walk in obedience. And we need to think of that in terms of the pattern of a person's life, not a particular instance in a person's life. So, yes, we all fail. We all stumble in many ways. James is going to say that in chapter 3 as it relates to the tongue. And that's he says, hey, you need to be careful. Not all of you should become teachers because you're going to receive a more severe judgment and we all stumble with our tongue. And so the point is, you don't want to jump into a role that God hasn't prepared for you because you're going to be held accountable for what you say, and we do struggle with our tongue. So he, he admits it. Um, but, but the difference, I think, is the we all fail at different times. We stumble. But what's the overall direction and pattern of our life? And the New Testament makes it abundantly clear that obedience is the pattern of those Mm. who know Christ and have put their faith in Christ. It's not that they don't stumble, that they don't fail. We think of Peter. It's always brought up, Peter denied Christ three times, and that's very true. What a colossal failure in Peter's life. But Peter didn't deny Christ every weekend for the rest of his life. Yeah, sure. Um, he, He failed, but he repented. And he was restored, and he continued the path of obedience. So if you think about Peter, 
You look at a life of faithful obedience, even though you see moments of failure in his life. And so I think um, we need to understand that Scripture calls us to obedience. We're to be doers of the Word. We're, we're able to do that by the work of the Holy Spirit in our life. Yes, we struggle at times. But the overall pattern is, is that of being a doer of the Word. And I think James is shaping that up because that's what true faith does in our lives. And I think that becomes really clear in, the, in the, his discussion on faith and works. So one of the things that you said from Sunday that stuck with me the most the past few days was that if we were in China having a house church meeting, would the government see us as a threat? So are we disruptive Christians or are we, are we like passive Christians that don't have much of a, an impact on our society. So what's the litmus test for a disruptful Christian? I think that our goal is not to be disruptive. Sure. So we don't sit around and plot and plan. How can we disrupt things? <laughs> How can we be radical? How can we... Um, stir the pot up. Sure. But the truth of the matter is, is that the gospel is disruptive. Yeah. It is a message that is offensive. Paul wrote about the offense of the cross. He talked about to the Jewish person, that's a stumbling block, the cross of Jesus Christ. How could the Messiah be killed like a thief on a cross? To the Gentile, it was just utter foolishness and nonsense. <laughs> what do you mean? We're, we're going to put our faith in a guy that died, who was crucified as a criminal. Hmm. But, yeah, right. but the gospel message itself is, dis is disruptive in our lives. It, it caused people to confront the fact that we're sinners, that we've fallen short of the glory of God, that our sin separates us from God. And that the only remedy is repentance and faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. And so, again, we're not, we're not seeking to be troublemakers, or we shouldn't be. <laughs> but the gospel itself and the cross itself is disruptive and offensive. So your question, what's the litmus test for being a disruptive Christian? And I think, quite simply, it's obedience. Hmm. Because if I live in obedience to what God word, God's Word says, I'm going to be living counter to the value system of this world. And if I live that openly and boldly, including sharing that, that offensive gospel with, with people, it's going to cause trouble. And I think reflecting back to the house church um, analogy or, or from the book written by three Chinese uh, house church pastors, that, that people who just profess, hey, we're believers, they don't care about that. But, but people who are disciples that actually live out what the scriptures say, they do care about that because they know that's counter to what, um, what, what they're trying to do as a communist society. Mm. And so I guess in our world, here in the southeastern United States, we might say that cultural Christianity is not disruptive or radical at all. It's comfortable. It, it, it's pleasant. It's kind of like a, a country club. <laughs> but, but true biblical Christianity is, is radical. It, it is counter-cultural, and, and, and it does disrupt things in our lives and in our society. When you start calling people to repent, when you start talking about what the Scripture says, what does God's Word say about, about life? What does God's Word say about homosexuality? You just take those two issues right there yeah, and right. speak biblical truth on them, and you will be disruptive. Yeah. And in fact, you will be disrupted. <laughs> You, you, will, you will have trouble and problems 
uh, with the world system and especially today. So again, our, our goal is not to be disruptive. We shouldn't seek to be troublemakers. The offense should not be in ourselves and our attitudes, but the offense must be the message of the cross and our obedience, our being doers of the word. Um, I would say that's the litmus test. That will um, stir things up. Hmm. And, and especially when you are sharing the gospel with people that they need to be saved and that the only hope is in Jesus Christ. Well, that's just counted as utter foolishness in the minds of lost people. But that's not new. Paul wrote about that. It's the same. So I think another area where we can, we can see is these three practical areas that you, you know, you outlined in your service, but it's the, it's the last two verses of this chapter, verses 26 and 27, these three practical areas uh, where the doers of the word will do. And those three were control your tongue, visit the orphans and the widows in their trouble, and remain unspotted from the world. And so, you know, we'll just kind of go into each one of those. That first one, control your tongue, I think that one is pretty pretty dang easy, <laughs> pretty easy to just kind of mess up in today's age where, you know, a lot of our interactions are online, are on social medias, are, are on things like that. And it's not face-to-face, so we're not always, a, you know, totally aware of, how how things that we're saying are being portrayed or how aggressive we're sounding or just how oblivious we can be. But uh, just here's a post that I've seen circulating on Facebook and uh, I just want to kind of get your thoughts on it because I know you don't check Facebook. <laughs> I don't, you don't even no, have I one. Don't. <laughs> I do not. <laughs> you check your wife's on just for our church stuff. But again, here's a post I've seen going around Facebook. Uh, My fellow Christians, everything that comes into your mind is not worth sharing. Take every thought captive and weigh it with the scriptures. Take a deep breath, consider kindness, and put others before yourself. The world will know we are Christians by our love, not our poorly formed opinions shot from the hip. I, I agree with what that says and the essence of what that says. It's certainly true that We shouldn't say everything that comes to our mind. Everything that comes to our mind is not worth sharing. But also sometimes the things that might come to our mind might need to be shared, but the timing may not be the appropriate time to share that. We're to take every thought captive, weigh it with the scriptures. That's biblical, that every thought is to be taken captive to the obedience of Jesus Christ. Um, We're to be kind think of others. Jesus said, the world will know you by your love that you have for one another. They'll know that you're my disciples. So, and and as the writer said, shooting off poorly formed opinions shot from the hip on a Facebook post or in some (laughs) kind of back and forth commenting war, um, those things are not not helpful. Hmm. So, James said, look, here's what true religion looks like. In fact, he said, if you, if you think you're religious, but you don't bridle your tongue, you're deceiving yourself. Your religion is worthless. Mm. That's a pretty strong statement. Yes. So, but let's, let's think about something here, Daniel, that I think we don't want to get confused about. Controlling your tongue means that, that the Holy Spirit, one of the fruits of the Spirit is self-control. So that you have the ability to to refrain from speaking when that's what's called for. Or you, you're you deliberate in what you say. Right. So you're speaking thoughtfully and intentionally, not from the hip, as, as the person posted, um, but deliberately with, with well-intended, um, th- careful thought. But let's make sure that we don't say that controlling your tongue means that you never say anything that's offensive. Right. Because by nature because we will. <laughs> because, yeah, because, well, but that's not biblical. We, we don't, we, as we just talked about, there's a lot of things in the Bible that are offensive. Right. 
And so we've got to make sure that we're willing to boldly speak, but that bold speech needs to be consistent with the Bible and it needs to be with deliberate thought. I need to speak deliberately and intentionally, not just flying off the handle and saying something. I need to say what needs to be said and what's intended to be said so that sometimes what I may say might be, um, might be painful. But we have to make sure that we speak the truth with love, as mm. the Apostle Paul said, with compassion, so that what we're saying is consistent with the Bible. Sometimes that can be painful. Sometimes we have to confront one another with, with painful realities. But we do it from the standpoint of self-control. Part of self-control that the Holy Spirit gives us is control of the tongue. We put a bridle on our tongue and we don't just um, spout off yeah. and, and shoot from the hip. What we're speaking deliberately and with thought and purpose. And we'll probably still, you know, if we do post a status, <laughs> if we bring it back to something on Facebook, if we post a status with a well-formed opinion that is biblical, there still might be an argument happening in your comments. And, well, and that goes back to the question of being um, disruptive. Well, if, if, if what I'm saying is consistent with the Bible and I'm saying it in a loving way and with careful thought, then the offense needs to be the offense of the message of the Bible, not my attitude or yeah. the way in which I present myself. So the first practical area was control your tongue. The second was the visit the orphans and widows in their trouble. And I know you have some things you want to say about that. Well, just remember visit doesn't mean just say hi. <laughs> The word means to actually bring relief or to help. Um, we use the analogy on Sunday where in the Bible where it talks about God visiting the Gentiles with salvation. He, he's, he's bringing um, salvation to the Gentiles. And, and so it, it carries more than just, again, a front porch, hi, how you doing, or a phone call or something like that. Yeah. So... A true test of our religion, as James says it, is helping the helpless. You know, that's been a hallmark characteristic of Christianity down through the ages. And, and, it, and it still is. And we need to do that personally. We need to do that as a church. We need to connect with, with helping to do that around the world. You know, I think I mentioned this in a message or I can't remember, maybe one of the online messages but send relief, S-E-N-D, relief, send relief. It's a partnership between the North American Mission Board of the Southern Baptist Convention and the International Mission Board of the Southern Baptist Convention and just our church and other churches through our regular monthly mission giving. Ultimately, that goes and, and part of it helps support those two mission boards and then through those, that, that partnership. And if you were to go online... And look it up, and I encourage you to do so. You see the different areas where they're serving and work. One is disaster relief. Things like hurricanes or floods or the COVID crisis. In practical ways, in the name of Jesus, bringing relief to people. Yeah. Uh, one is uh, foster care and adoption. Uh, that's another area in which they serve. One is human trafficking. That's another area that around the world they're trying to help bring relief and, and help people. And then the other was, um, was literacy. And, and you don't often think about that, that people that can't read, how, how much that affects their life. And, and one of the, the biggest connectors, literacy or the lack thereof, is a big connector with poverty. And so that's another part. And you don't often think of that literacy as missions work, doing it in the name of Christ, seeking to bring the gospel to people, but also helping them in a practical place 
And so helping the helpless, and particularly, as James points out, orphans and widows in their trouble, bringing relief, that's, that's a hallmark of, mm-hmm. of true biblical Christianity. So the last practical area was remain unspotted from the world. And I think uh, it's, it's pretty easy to become used to certain things and just kind of dismiss them. <laughs> uh, so the question is just like, what are some common ways that we as Christians have been influenced by the world, but we dismiss it? And this is kind of including you and me as well, because I think for me, obvious ones are just like when I'm watching TV, I'll just dismiss things that I'll, you know, I could totally, I could recommend a movie or a TV show that has plenty of unchristian values but I dismiss them very quickly because I'm just used to them being in, in TV and movies. But there's plenty of ways. Uh, but what are some ways that, you know, we as Christians have been influenced by the world, but we just dismiss it. We don't really put too much weight on it. Well, when you see the phrase, true religion before God and undefiled before God, is to help widows and orphans and to keep yourself unspotted from the world. Well, there are certain things that, that we might immediately think of as being worldly. But then there are certain other things that are worldly as well that we don't think of. Hmm. And so uh, here's, here's just a few that we should think through. Materialism. So materialism... Hmm where we, we either value ourselves or value other people based on what we have and how much we have, the desire to always have more and mm. not be content with what God has given us, that, that's a very pervasive thing, particularly in our, in our society, in our culture. Yeah. But we just dismiss it. In fact, sometimes we applaud it. And actually, it's very, very much a part of worldliness, that 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 craving to always have more um, and to value ourselves based on what we do have or or to devalue ourselves based on what we don't have, I think materialism is a way that we are stained and spotted by the world and we don't often acknowledge it. Entertainment, you mentioned it. Um, what amuses us says a lot about ourselves. Hmm. And so I think we, we need to keep the filters high there. We need to make sure that what we're watching and what we're, what we're looking to for enjoyment is consistent with the scriptures in that we're not entertaining ourselves with things that are highly offensive to God. But we, um, we often do it. Don't think anything about it. Yeah. And it's a way that a worldly mindset can creep into us. The cult of self, self-worship, is a form of idolatry. And you say, what do you mean, the cult of self? Well, and, and I don't want to go on a rant here, <laughs> um, but you think about, just think about what is posted on social media. Most of it, or, or excuse me, a lot of it is, is me presenting myself to you in a way that's most favorable to me. Yeah. <laughs> and so I assume that you should be interested in knowing what I had for supper last night <laughs> or in knowing that I cut the grass, or what I think about this, or what I think about that. And there's a subtle shift that can happen there. Um, we, we, we can become very obsessed with ourselves and make an idol of ourselves. Now again, there's nothing wrong with, hey, we're posting pictures, our family wants to see our missions trip, or what the kids look like, they're growing up so fast and things like that. Those are all legitimate and great uses of it. But especially many people more than me who are heavily involved and engaged in that area, you know what I'm talking about. You know there, there is a, um, a selfish self-promotion 
that can can invade, and, and at the heart of that is worldliness. We need to be careful of that. And then the final thing is this, and, and I want to connect it directly with the next passage in James, where in chapter 2 he talks about holding the faith of the Lord Jesus Christ with, with favoritism or with discrimination or, or partiality is the word that's used. And so when there's favoritism in the church, when we treat one group of people differently than we treat another group of people based on their outward appearance, that is in the essence of what James is talking about. In mm -hmm. fact, it's the very next thing that James talks about when he says, keep yourself unspotted from the world. And then he launches right into one of his longest discussions, actually in the Bible, excuse me, in the book of James about any one subject. And it has to do with... Um, with with favoritism, showing partiality in the church. A rich man comes in and he's treated, oh man, you're the you're the greatest. We're so glad you're here. A poor man comes in and he's like, hey, you can sit on the floor. Hmm. Um, we don't care if you're here or not. I think don't disconnect what he says. Keep yourself unspotted from the world with what he says next. Because what he says next has to do with favoritism, with, with receiving the face is the word that's used. It has to do, I, I make my judgment based on the outward appearance of whether this person has value or they don't have value and how I treat them. Hmm. And, and discrimination, favoritism, partiality, that's at the heart of being stained and spotted by this world system because that is the way the world treats people. It's all based on what you look like, how much money do you have? And, and that's, that's, that's central and core to worldliness. Yeah. Well, that'll wrap up this week's episode. Thanks again for listening. Uh, join us on Sunday for worship. Uh, that's 9 a.m. in person, whether that's uh, in, the plan is outside unless it rains. And then if you're watching online, tune us in around noon. We've been getting it up at noon the past two Sundays. Uh, but thanks for listening and have a great week.